Okay, the session is now recording. So I'll, I will post this later on. Uh, for those of you who cannot attend, it'll be posted on Moodle. And uh, taking off where we left off last time, we were just fin finishing the history off and I got a couple questions about the exam. Uh, when it comes to exam questions, we'll go through this in more detail uh, on a review session. When it comes to the history component, it will be on the exam. But what we will be doing is um, the questions will not have anything to do with the dates, but we'll say things like which system of medicine uh, uses the three doshas or um, Samuel Thompson, um, what was his contribution in some way or who were the eclectics and things like that. So I'll give you a bunch of sample questions before the exam. Um, right now where we left off was we're in North America now. <clears throat> so a quick little recap when it came to Western herbalism. It sort of originated in Egypt and then in the Greco-Roman times it sort of evolved further there. Um, they developed the four humors um, that then went on to be sort of evolved in the Middle East and then eventually it made its way over to North America. And so I would say American herbalism is a combination of traditional European uh, um, herbalism that originates in Greco-Roman uh, herbal medicine and then it's further evolved with contributions from ind indigenous people in North America. So with uh, people coming to North America, uh, they spoke with First Nations people and they learned about a number of new herbs that weren't a part of European herbalism. One of the first contributors is an individual called Samuel Thompson. And this was a man who's considered to be the father, father of American herbalism. Now he was not trained as a doctor or a pharmacist. He was uneducated. And he first learned about herbs uh, by speaking with First Nations people. And back at the time, medicine was a little bit dangerous. Conventional medicine, they're doing a lot of extreme things that included things like bloodletting, or giving people mercury or antimony and things like that um, that were quite toxic and so a lot of people were scared to go into their medical doctor because sometimes the treatments were worse than the diseases that you actually had and I believe George Washington is an individual who actually died from bloodletting because in the old days they believed that if you're sick and they would maybe drain some blood out of you that um, it would help to remove whatever the, the illness was. Uh, but, at some, but at the point, um, there was a lot of people who actually might die or could die from uh, the actual procedure. So uh, when it came to using things like mercury, it was often given to people, uh, mainly because it produced very pronounced symptoms, including nausea and vomiting. And um, it might kill off some types of infections that they had, but it was so toxic in the individual that they would often die. So Samuel Thompson, the reason why he became interested in herbal medicine was that he had a family member who almost died from seeing a medical doctor and he was opposed to this uh, conventional approach because it was just too harsh. And so by speaking with indigenous people, he learned about a number of herbs. And um, what he ended up doing was compiling a lot of this um, and creating little herbal patents that he would sell and he, so he was also a businessman he made a lot, bunch of money from it as well. Um, now the unfortunate thing is the knowledge that he acquired was from First Nations people and we don't really know who those individuals were uh, and they don't often get credited but that's where he got most of his information from. Now in about the seven, around 1780 there was a number of medical doctors um, that formed sort of an organization, formed an organization and they were called the eclectics and these were physicians who were opposed to this whole type of conventional medicine that they were they're using bloodletting and mercury and some toxic drugs and so they incorporated herbal medicine into the practice of medicine and try to do more gentle supportive approaches so these guys are often um, when it comes to herbal medicine in North America they're very, very important individuals and they wrote a number of texts. Um, some of the important individuals were uh, John Lloyd, Scooter, Felter, King, and the information that they had was um, was written down in a number of books, including King's American Dispensatory, which is a book that was written by both the doctors and pharmacists. 
and they were some of the first people in North America to really document the, the indications for these herbs and we still reference these books in Western herbalism today and uh, so for a number of, for over a hundred years um, they played an important role in medicine in North America um, but then due to politics uh, what happened in about 1910 is that the American Medical Association uh, wanted to create standards of practice and and basically the eclectics who were using herbal medicine it didn't jive with what uh, the American Medical Association wanted to do so they basically in the Flexner report they shut down these eclectic uh, colleges and basically told these practitioners that you're no longer allowed to use the herbal medicine and you have to basically follow our guidelines otherwise um, you're not allowed to practice medicine so um, they kind of the eclectics basically dissolved uh, in about the 1930s and since then um, really herbal medicine hasn't been a component of conventional medicine and it was then adopted later on by the uh, herbalists and naturopathic doctors in, in North America. Um, so on the left hand side you can see an image of Samuel Thompson, one of the books that he wrote on uh, herbal medicine and some of the herbs that were used in North America that um, were not part of Western herbalism were things like lobelia. So on the left hand side it's a herb called Indian tobacco and um, it was used for respiratory conditions and it would also induce nausea and vomiting. Um, so it had some of the properties that you might see with a toxic heavy metal like mercury that caused a lot of vomiting because in the old days it was seen that if you could induce vomiting it would sort of a, um, uh, would have like a detoxifying effect. Uh, we still use this today for respiratory complaints. It's also used as a to help with smoking cessation. There is John King, uh, an important medical doctor who, who was uh, one of the contributors to um, King's American Defense Story. And some other herbs that are important in North American herbalism is things like cedar. Cedar is one of the um, four important herbs by the Ojibwe tribes and uh, the indigenous people and it seemed to be, it's believed to be a sacred plant and it has a number of antimicrobial properties too and antiviral properties. Uh, it may, there are some people who speculate that it may have been used as a source of vitamin C to help treat scurvy. I'm not quite sure exactly what plants were used but when um, the early settlers came here a lot of them were getting scurvy and the indigenous people would use uh, a couple of different plants to help with that and cedar may have been one of them as a source of vitamin C. Echinacea is another herb that grows wild in North America. I think everyone knows that this plant is sort of the mascot for natural medicine. Um, it's used primarily for to treat colds and flus and various infections. Both the root and the aerial parts have medicinal properties to it that are unique. Um, it's useful. One of my favorite herbs is golden seal. Uh, this is a plant that has very good antimicrobial actions. So it's effective against bacteria and viruses and fungi. I often use this in herbal, herbal formulas for to treat some types of uh, infection. Black cohosh is another herb that grows in North America and it's primarily used for female complaints. There's research showing there may be benefits for things like hot flashes. It was also used for menstrual cramps um, and to balance hormones in women. And that sort of concludes the section on the history and what we're going to do is move on and discuss some of the similarities and differences between pharmaceutical drugs. Now I'm just going to check and see if I have any questions right now. So just give me one second. No, no questions yet. That's good. If you do, I'll just check my questions after each section and just to see whether or not you have any. So when it comes to pharmaceutical drugs, they are very different um, than herbs and I'm just going to outline some of the differences between the two. When it comes to drugs, drugs are purified substances where you basically have typically one chemical that's in it. And um, some today it's not uncommon to see a couple of drugs combined with you know one or two other drugs. Uh, occasionally three drugs. In the case of antiretroviral uh, viral drugs used to treat HIV, they might combine a few of these together. But in general, it, it's a very purified 
chemical where you're getting one active ingredient. Now, to contrast that with herbs, herbs typically have hundreds of compounds in there, and it's possible that a few of these compounds or even dozens of these compounds have medicinal properties, and it may be different classes of compounds that have some kind of therapeutic effect. And so if you isolate a single compound from a herb, um, it's look, it sort of behaves more like a drug in the sense that you only have one active ingredient. <clears throat> but there are often other synergistic compounds that, that are in herbs that kind of help the herb work better when it's given in a whole herb, whole form, rather than if you just do a purified extract with, let's say, 99% of one active ingredient. Um, it just becomes different. It may not be worse or better. Uh, in some, some cases, it may become more powerful. In other cases, um, it may become less effective. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Now, when it comes to the quality um, drugs and herbs, drugs are very, very pure, and you get a, a very specific and precise amount of the active ingredients. So you might get 500 milligrams of acetaminophen, or you might get 3 milligrams of some other active um, drug. And typically what's inside the capsule or the tablet or the pill that you're taking uh, will be very close within a few percentage uh, of what the labels is. Now, when it comes to herbs, one of the challenges with the herbs is that the quality can change from year to year or from batch to batch. Um, there is some belief that depending on even when you gather the herb, whether that's if you gather the herb in September or whether you get, gather it in the fall, there'll be different constituents in it. Another thing is um, sometimes with like plants that are rich in essential oils, if you gather the plants first thing in the morning, you're going to have higher amounts of certain essential oils than if you gather it later in the afternoon when some of these volatile oils have evaporated off. So there's a lot more variability within the herbs. It's kind of like wine, uh, like red wine, where you could have uh, a good bottle of wine from Spain in, let's say, 2005. The Riojas, Riojas were really, really good uh, then, and maybe not as good in 2013. Um, and a lot of the active constituents in the wine uh, vary from year to year or from region to region. So um, now, the, in defense of wine, um, regardless of when it's made or what year it's been made or what country it's been made in, it'll still get you drunk and it still has a lot of medicinal properties to it, but there is some variation. So some of the active ingredients like resveratrol might be higher uh, from wines that are grown in certain regions than from other regions, uh, but it, ultimately there are still beneficial effects of, of taking that. So um, one of the main differences between drugs and, <clears throat> and herbs also is the potency. And <clears throat> what I mean by that is I would say generally speaking drugs are very powerful substances um, that tend to have more side effects than herbs do. Now there are exceptions to, to this. There are certain herbs that um, even small amounts, even milligrams or one flower is enough to potentially make someone sick or even cause death. Now herbs, most of the herbs that we use are very safe to take short term and long term. Um, they tend to be less potent so they don't really disrupt the body as much and so that makes them safer in general than drugs do. Now there are like I said, there are exceptions to this, but in general, I'd say that drugs are less potent, but safer. Now, people might say, well, I don't want to take some kind of medicine that's not as strong or not as potent. But as I might have mentioned last time, it's you got to make sure you use the right tools for the job. And if you're an archaeologist, you could hire a backhoe to go and dig up some sort of ancient ruins um, or a bulldozer. And a bulldozer is much more powerful or much stronger uh, and effective at removing and clearing sand or dirt than something like a, a shovel or a brush is. But using a shovel and brush, it might take a little longer, but um, it definitely reduces the risk of causing damage to the structure that you're trying to uh, uncover. So when it comes to, I think, for people that are not too sick, uh, but maybe they have high cholesterol or high blood pressure, Sometimes starting with something that's a little more gentle, like diet and lifestyle and a few herbs, um, is going to be more effective, even if it takes a little longer. You have to combine a few things together to make it effective. Um, but at least it tends to have less side effects than going right away to drugs. 
Now, another thing um, that influences drugs and herbs is the ability to make money from uh, selling them. And so drugs, when you create a new drug, what that means is you might take a structure that exists in nature, tweak it a little bit, and now you have a structure that's never existed before. So you get credit for that and you get a patent. And that patent means that for the next 10 years, you have exclusive rights at selling that drug. And in defense of the drug companies or the pharmaceutical companies, they ultimately are a business and they have to make a profit in order to make their shareholders happy. And so the FDA and Health Canada gives them this 10 year patent so that they can spend the money to invest into research to develop a new drug and then make their money back and make some profit by using that patent. Um, now, the problem with herbs is that there's not a lot of incentive to do research in this because you can't really patent a herb. Now, you might be able to patent um, a proprietary blend of herbs. So if you combine a few plants together and created a unique formula and did research on that formula, you could market that. Or you might be able to patent some sort of extraction process of how to get the main active ingredients out. Um, but it, it, it doesn't have the same financial incentive that you might get um, from, from investing a lot of research into a new drug. <clears throat> now, finally, when it comes to the additional actions, because drugs typically have one active ingredient, it usually has um, sort of one or two main actions associated with it. So you develop a drug, it might act as an antihypertensive to lower blood pressure. Um, it might also behave as a diuretic. So it might have one or two or possibly three uh, medicinal properties to it. But when it comes to herbs, when you read the monographs, and a monograph is basically a one or two page little description of what the herb can be used for, it often outlines what are the actions for this herb. So chamomile might be the primary indication for primary action for chamomile. Tea might be as a carminative, uh, an antispasmodic. It might also be an anti-inflammatory. It might be a vulnerary. So there could be anywhere between five and 10 or 20 medicinal actions associated with it because you have things like bioflavonoids, which have one particular action associated with it. You might have sesquiterpene lactones that have another uh, action associated with it. You might have uh, essential oils that have other actions associated with it. So when you're learning about a herb, drugs are pretty easy. They're usually the drug has one or two main indications and maybe there might be a couple of off-label indications or secondary indications for it. Herbs, sometimes you'll see that there are maybe dozens of conditions it could be used to treat. And there could be primary conditions it's used for, which is sort of what it's designed for. And then secondary indications where it's not the best herb for the job, but um, if you don't have any other herbs available, then that would be a, still a good option for you. So that's one thing about the difference between the drugs and the herbs is the number of actions and conditions they can be used to treat. And another thing is that although Herbs and drugs will share a lot of the same medicinal actions, for example, a diuretic, anti-inflammatory, anti-hypertensive, things like that. Herbs do have some actions that are very unique um, to herbal medicine. And so an action like an adaptogen, which is the ability to help the body cope with stress, or, or something like an alternative, which is used to cleanse the blood and help with skin conditions and normalize the function of the body, or bitters, which help to promote digestion, or phytoestrogens, um, which balance hormones. These don't. These terms typically don't exist in the pharmaceutical world, and so they are unique to um, to herbal medicine. <clears throat> now, the next thing I want to talk about is how pharmaceutical drugs can be obtained from plants. Historically, the majority of drugs on the market have been obtained from a plant. Um, to varying degrees. And so what they might do is find some plant that we know in herbal medicine has some action and then they'll do an extraction on it, find the active ingredient and they might basically um, use the exact chemical found in the plant or they might just tweak it a little tiny bit. And so in a lab it's easy to add a carbon here or add um, you know, an acetyl group there and that now becomes a unique compound which you can patent and it might help to enhance 
the therapeutic benefits of, of this active ingredient or it might help to reduce some of the side effects. So a lot of the, a lot of the drugs that are on the market now were once derived from plants. Now I would say in the past 20 years, pharmaceutical companies have become a little bit more sophisticated in their approach to developing new drugs. <clears throat> a lot of the drugs now on the market, um, they might obtain them by um, doing some 3D modeling of enzymes and then based on that they can sort of develop structures, uh, chemical structures that go into the right active sites on these in these enzymes or, or proteins to turn them on or off or whatever. And uh, a couple, about 20 years ago, I used to work for Mark Frost, a drug company in in, um, um, in Montreal. Um, well, that's where they're situated in Canada. And one of the things that they're doing, which is really exciting at the time, is they're using really, really powerful computers, which probably now are about as powerful as my iPad, but uh, they're using powerful computers to make 3D modelings of various enzymes and you could put these 3D goggles on and it's like you're going into a cave and you could see the various amino acids coming out of the, um, of the enzymes um, uh, active site and then they would basically sort of draw out which types of molecules like an oxygen molecule could bind to here or a sulfur molecule could bind to there and have its active effects. So it's really, really neat stuff that they were doing and, um, and, and exciting. My one criticism of that approach is the fact that Mother Nature has never seen these compounds before and so it's really hard to predict uh, what sort of effects they're going to have on the population and one of the scary things I find about drugs is generally speaking I don't trust new drugs at all. Um, usually what happens when they develop a new drug is they make it in a lab and then one of the first things they do is they'll test it in a test tube against various cells to see how it behaves then they'll give it to some kind of animal, probably rats or mice to begin with, to see if, how safe it is or how toxic. And then they might try it on dogs or primates doing, before they do the first clinical trial. And then once they do a clinical trial on these drugs, um, you give the drug to usually white males, and I don't mean to sound racist or sexist, but white males are usually preferred uh, to start off with because they're isolating a lot of variables. Uh, women have hormones that go on, but um, that can interfere with stuff. And they choose a, um, a very specific population and measure the effects of the drugs. And if it's safe, they might expand that to other groups. Um, but once the drugs come on the market, they may have only been tested on thousands of people. And what's scary about that is sometimes side effects only occur in, let's say, point. 0.1% of the population or 1% of the population and if you only have a few thousand people who have tried the drug you may not have hit that sort of critical mass of patients before you see the side effects that occur in a very small percentage so this is this happens all the time where a drug is released on the market and then five years later they suddenly notice that all these people taking this particular anti-inflammatory drug suddenly um, start having heart failure and they're like, oh, okay, we didn't see that in the clinical trials because it was only, because this is only affecting 0.01% of the population or whatever the number is. Or they might find that the drug's safe, except if you give it to elderly patients or women or children uh, or teenagers or whatever it may be. So there's a lot of um, concerns that I have for a drug that is released, recently released on the market. At least drugs that have been around on the market for about 30 or 40 years, enough people have taken these drugs that we're pretty confident we know what what the good and the bad is with these drugs. But newer drugs, we just, you know, the real clinical trial, in my opinion, starts once they've been released on the market and five years later, we're going to have a much better idea of uh, how effective they are and how safe they are. So when it comes back to pharmaceutical drugs and plants, one of the things that we can use plants for is to explore how to develop new drugs. And so, like I mentioned before, they might look at traditional medicine uh, in the past and use that as a way to sort of find a new anti-inflammatory or a new anti-cancer drug. And so, they'll look at existing indications, herbal indications, and use that to exploit uh, these plants to get new drugs out of it. Sometimes, drug companies will just take, um, let's say, thousands and thousands of specimens of plants, put them in a little... Um, I forget what they're called down a little 
little uh, cell culture or sorry little um, um, little mini test tubes and expose let's say cancer cells to thousands of different plant extracts that may or may not have any known anti-cancer properties to it just as a screening way of screening these plants to see if there's any activity um, and then one of the final ways that you can use plants is you take an existing phytochemical uh, as a source to make other drugs out of it. So it's just basically being used as a uh, building block, kind of like a little Lego piece. And so when you're, act, uh, I worked as a synthetic chemist for a while, and you don't want to start with, let's say if you have a compound that has 30 carbons and a couple oxygens on it, you don't want to start off with one carbon and then add another carbon and then add another carbon and then add an oxygen and add another carbon because it is very expensive and it will take a long time. So one of the strategies is that it might take an existing um, phytochemical and then use that as a building block to cut a carbon off or add a few more carbons on here and there and an oxygen or a sulfur or whatever it may be and then you develop your drug from that. So it just saves a lot of steps and that makes it more cost effective. So um, listed below are a few different drugs that we're going to use as examples of how um, plants have been used to make these guys. And so digoxin is a heart medication and it's generally speaking uh, it's used for, or it used to be used for congestive heart failure. There's other drugs they're using now. And you can see a picture of it on the left hand side. William Withering was a medical doctor who in the 1700s um, he had some patients that had congestive heart failure and he basically told them, I'm sorry, I'm sorry there's nothing I can do for you and these patients went off and explored alternative medicine, went and spoke to a local herbalist and a local herbalist um, gave them digitalis and to help with this congestive heart failure. Now in the old days they called it dropsy which um, the symptoms were you might have a lot of swelling and water and flu build up in your ankles because the heart's not pumping effectively. Um, and so the patients that took the digitalis went back to their doctor and said, oh, I'm all better now uh, because I took this plant the herbalist gave me. And so William Withering was curious about this, explored it, and he was the first one to basically record and document the use of digitalis, um, or, which is foxglove, uh, for heart failure. Now, the sad thing is, is that he took all the credit for it. He's William got all the credit for uh, discovering this new plant. Meanwhile, the herbalist or the wise woman or wise man or whoever it was, um, druid or whoever it may have been who discovered it, uh, doesn't get any of the credits because basically William was the guy who wrote the book. So so there's an example of digoxin is one. There's a chemical structure there. It's a type of uh, steroidal saponin. We'll discuss it later on. Generally speaking, I don't use this in most naturopaths do not use foxglove because it's not very safe and it may be um, easier to control the variables if you give it as a drug form because you can give precise amounts of it, like three milligrams of it, uh, while in the herb it might be harder to dose. So this isn't really used that much in herbal medicine anymore. I don't think uh, we're allowed to use it, um, but in conventional medicine it is a drug. So. The next drug we'll talk about is aspirin. Um, aspirin's chemical name is acetylsalicylic acid. Now, salicylic acid is a compound that's found in lots of different plants, including fruits and vegetables uh, and different barks of uh, trees. And salicylic acid um, extracted from willow bark was used traditionally to treat various inflammatory conditions and fevers. And this um, was isolated and then modified a little bit um, to make acetyl salicylic acid. Now the acetyl group is, I don't know if I can, I can't easily show this on a slide unless I zoom, nope I can't show you. My pointer doesn't work, I'm sorry about that, in this format. Uh, if you look at the bottom structure, there's a two carbon structure attached to the oxygen at the very bottom of the molecule. That's the acetyl group and it's not uncommon to have acetyl groups added to various substances to stabilize it and um, it can modify the structure a little bit. And so acetyl groups are also added to things like vitamin E as well, so it's not just drugs but also some natural supplements. And um, so I think everyone here knows aspirin or acetylsalicylic acid. 
and this is a common substance that you can find pretty much anywhere now. And originally it was from willow bark, but you can obtain it from other plants as well. Now, ephedra is a plant that's been used in Greco-Roman medicine. It's been used in Chinese medicine. Uh, it was used by the ancient Egyptians. And it's a plant that contains the active compound ephedrine. Or, and ephedrine and pseudoephedrine products on the market are found in a lot of cold and flu uh, formulas. And these are very, very potent decongestants. And the way that they work is they stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. And by doing that, it decreases um, inflammation and, and edema in the nose to help people breathe better. It also opens up the bronchioles to help um, breathe better as well. Uh, it has an anti-allergic effect, so it sort of suppresses a lot of the symptoms associated with colds, flus, and also allergies. So um, ephedrine is a little bit like a mild form of adrenaline. Um, and this is where it was found in, in these plants, various species of ephedra. So when you see, for example, when I go ephedra spp dot, that just basically means ephedra species. And that's not one particular species of ephedra. It could be different ones. So in China or in Greece, they might have a different variety or a different species that they're using. But they all potentially have the same effects. And so ephedra has been used historically in herbal medicine for various uh, respiratory conditions. And that's the main active ingredient there. That's the ephedrine molecule there. It's an alkaloid. Uh, it's a very, very potent um, chemical. And I would say ephedra, the plant, it's also a pretty uh, strong herb for treating illnesses. And there are side effects, including high blood pressure and may cause anxiety. Um, it's also used, uh, could be abused and used for something like weight loss um, because it does stimulate uh, uh, um, fat breakdown. So the first three substances we discussed either exist exactly, um, the active ingredients exist in nature in that form or, or have been modified just a little bit. Now, all those plants have been used historically in herbal medicine to treat a particular condition and then the drugs are used for essentially the same thing. Now, there is a drug called Taxol and Taxol is an anti-cancer drug, and it has a kind of an interesting um, history to it. It's originally obtained from a plant called Pacific Yew that grows on the west coast of North America. And Pacific Yew has no traditional medical indications. Um, and so it has never been used in herbal medicine. And the way they discovered it was they were screening hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plants uh, for anti-cancer activity. And they just sort of stumbled across it and found, oh, this seems to be effective. And so they then took the Pacific U extract, figured out what the main active ingredient was, and then they said, okay, so it's this tax all molecules. This is the anti-cancer um, active ingredient there. Now, if you look at the structure of the tax on the left, even if you're not a chemist, you can appreciate there's a lot going on with that molecule. And one of the challenges with this molecule is that there are a lot of chiral centers. And what a chiral center is is, if you try to make this in a lab, what will happen is um, each time you come across a chiral center, you're going to get a left-handed and a right-handed version of the molecule. And you only want one of them, let's say the right-handed side. And so that means that you could potentially have 50% waste product every time you try to make it. Now this Paxil molecule has, I don't know precisely how many I could count them up, but numerous chiral centers. And so what that means is if you were to try to make this from scratch, you might start from a few different molecules uh, and combining them, but you're still, it's going to take at least 30 or 40 steps to make this and you're going to lose a lot of waste product. So one of the problems is you might start off with, let's say, a kilogram of active ingredient, or sorry, a kilogram of starting material. Um, and then by the time you're done, you're only going to obtain a few milligrams of the desired compound and you wasted you know, over 90% of the material uh, to make it. And so for a period of time, it was really difficult for drug companies to make this. And when I was in university, we took a course, an after performance course, and they were discussing it. And they hadn't really done a lot of research yet uh, on it. I think they were just doing some clinical trials, and they knew this was effective. 
but the big problem was that they could not isolate it from natural sources because if you took if you tried to cut down the Pacific yew trees and, and do an extraction and obtain it that way, basically in one year you destroy all the Pacific yews and it would no longer you, you could no longer uh, obtain it from nature. So it's not feasible to get it from um, from the plants. It's almost impossible to uh, synthesize it uh, in a lab. And so they were kind of stuck because they had uh, a great treatment for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, um, but they had no way of obtaining it and distributing it. So uh, what they ended up doing is, because at the time, I guess, um, um, biotechnology was still in its infancy, they eventually figured out a way to grow the cells from, I guess, I'm assuming the Pacific yew tree in a test tube and then obtain the drug that way. So they use a process called plant cell fermentation technology in order to obtain the active ingredient. And so Taxol and its derivatives are now on the market. People have been taking these things for um, probably over a decade now uh, to treat breast cancer. I've seen and other types of um, cancers like that. I've seen it used on a number of patients. Um, and so the take home message with this, with Taxol, is the fact that it never existed Pacific U never uh, existed or never was never used in traditional herbal medicine. Um, they just found it through screening of plants and then uh, basically it's now become a drug. So Now another interesting drug is called Tamiflu and Tamiflu is, is an important antiviral drug. When we were uh, worried about some of these flu pandemics like H1N1, uh, SARS, um, Basically, Tamiflu was being stockpiled by comp countries uh, because it does work as an antiviral and has some some benefits. Now, the thing is that Tamiflu Tamiflu itself does not exist in nature. So this is a drug that you won't find it anywhere in nature. There's nothing that looks remotely like this in nature. Um, but they will use plants to obtain it. Now, the plant that I showed you before, uh, I don't know if I can look up. Oops. Sorry, one second. I lost my picture. This plant on the left-hand side is called star anise. And so star anise is not, uh, there are, I mean, it is used in herbal medicine, but it does not contain shikimic acid, or it does not contain uh, Tamiflu, but it does contain something called shikimic acid. And shikimic acid is an intermediate that plants used used to make certain amino acids. Now humans don't make shikimic acid, but plants do. And it happens to be that um, star anise is rich in shikimic acid. And with these flu pandemics, um, the cost of, of, of um, star anise it basically went up tenfold uh, in a very short period of time because drug companies were wanting to buy it up and use it as a, as a building block to make uh, tam uh, Tamiflu. And so what they do is they use the basic intermediate for making the amino acids and then they take that molecule and they modify it through a number of steps to make Tamiflu. So I want to emphasize that star anise does not contain Tamiflu. Star anise, I don't think it has any major antiviral properties. Certainly it doesn't have the same effects that the Tamiflu does, but the star anise is used as a building block to make the Tamiflu. Um, now, moving on, another important drug that I want to kind of give a little story about is one called artemisin. Now, what's neat about artemisin is it helps give a really good story of how we know how in herbal medicine there might be a plant that's been used for thousands of years, but it takes a long time before the research catches up and it's finally approved um, and, and adopted as, as a drug. And so here's a picture of, of uh, somewhere in Africa. I did not take this picture. I wish I would have. It's a beautiful photo. Um, but this is a picture of a man harvesting Artemisin, or Artemisia annua, which is Chinese wormwood. It doesn't grow. It's not native to Africa. It doesn't grow there uh, except when they cultivate it. And so they're basically cultivating this plant to be used for malaria uh, because the drugs are too expensive. Now, to give a little quick story on uh, the drug Artemisin, it's an anti-malarial drug. And what's interesting about this is that 
The plant has been used for at least a couple thousand years in Chinese medicine. And so we knew about it. It was documented as written down in books for 2,000 years. And it wasn't until about 1967 that Chinese researchers were doing extracts looking for new anti-malarial drugs and they discovered that um, Chinese wormwood, which was used historically for uh, malaria, had some active ingredient that was effective in a test tube study, in vitro study. And so after that, it wasn't until 1984 that the first randomized controlled trial was done with humans and it was published in The Lancet and this was a really important trial. And so this study showed that it was effective and could be used to treat malaria. And what's interesting is it was basically 20 years later after hundreds and hundreds of clinical trials were performed and several systematic reviews were done that finally artemisin based combinational therapy, so using artemisin with other drugs, was adopted by 43 countries and it was used as a first line therapy against chloroquine resistant malaria. And so what's interesting about that is even after the first human trial was done in 1984, it still took decades and an awful lot of research. And you can see all the research studies done uh, at the bottom of the page from 1980 to 2013. Those were all the studies that were done. And it took a long time before finally the World Health Organization adopted this drug. And so one of the issues that I have is that with research is, here's an example of something that we've known about for 2,000 years. And even after the first studies were done showing benefit in humans, um, it still didn't get adopted. And like if you look at the number of research studies required before the World Health, Health Organization changed their policies was, was significant. And so in that period of time, probably in the late or early 90s, there was enough evidence that it should have been adopted at that point, but there was just a delay in, in, in the policymakers. And as a result of that, what that means is that hundreds or thousands of people uh, have died of malaria that didn't need to die because there was an effective drug for it. Um, so when it comes to herbal medicine, you know, for people to say their herbs don't work, well, I don't think that's fair. I think they do work. I just think that there isn't enough research to support some of these herbs, but it doesn't mean that they don't work. It's just nobody spent the money and the time uh, to do it. And even if the research exists, it still won't be accepted potentially. So when it comes to treating things like cancer, um, I would say that there are a lot of natural products that could treat cancer or treat drug resistant bacteria um, and they could be used alone or in conjunction with therapies and they may have a lot of potential and I, I believe that they do work um, to some degree but it's going to take a long time before it's accepted and adopted by conventional medicine which is I guess good for naturopathic doctors but um, bad for the patients that don't see us. So. Now I'm going to take just stop for one second and check my questions. Uh, Carly asks, how exactly does Taxol help to treat cancer? Is it an enzyme they were trying to extract? No, Taxol is a drug that when you have cells, when they replicate, um, you basically have the telomeres pull apart the um, the the, 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 the genetic makeup, the DNA and everything, and then you form the two cells. And I believe what it does is it inhibits the telomeres uh, that help to pull or attach to the spindle fiber that pull it apart, the chromosomes apart. Um, sorry, my brain's a little slow because I haven't thought about this in about 20 years. Um, so I believe that's how they inhibit cell replication through that mechanism. So they tend it tends to be used more for, at least originally in, for breast and ovarian cancers, but I think Last time I looked at some of the research, they're using it for other types of cancers as well. Okay. Uh, so here's another question uh, from Jane. Is it correct to say that turmeric is a herb, whereas the extracted curcuminoids are a drug? Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Now, the term drug comes from the word druga, which is a German word meaning plant. So depending on how you define a drug, originally drugs were plant extracts and that's what they were, it was defined, that's where the name came from. Um, I would say that it's fair to say that turmeric is definitely a herb, there's no doubt about that. And that the curcuminoids, uh, let's say the main active ingredient, curcumin, um, 
it's a uh, phytochemical that you could classify as a drug depending on how you're how you're looking at it because if you get an extract that's 99.9% .9 curcumin um, in my mind it's more like a drug in many ways than a herb just because it has one active ingredient and that doesn't mean it's a bad thing it just means it's different and on, when it comes to turmeric for example most of the research has put an emphasis on looking at the curcuminoids for having their anti-inflammatory anti-cancer properties and um, there's no doubt that curcumin and the other curcuminoids have a lot of medicinal properties and, and potential to them. But one of the things that they've um, forgotten to, or maybe one of the things that's been ignored, is that there are carbohydrates in turmeric, the whole herb, that have been shown to have anti inflammatory properties. And the structure of those are completely different than their curcumin, curcumin and the curcuminoids. So, it may be that taking turmeric powder, uh, you have a synergistic effect with the carbohydrates that have an anti-inflammatory effects and the curcuminoids as well. There's also essential oils in turmeric that may have medicinal properties. So um, I don't know at this point if you had cancer, if it's better to take a 99% extract of curcumin with or um, um, standardized curcumin extract, if it's going to be more effective or not. Um, but there is potential for some of the other constituents to have some benefit as well. So uh, I'd love to see a comparison between turmeric powder, uh, a teaspoon of turmeric powder added to, let's say, tomato juice versus taking a capsule of, of curcumin extract. Um, I've recommended both to patients. Uh, some people see benefits of both and some people don't see benefits of either one. So it's hard to know exactly and this is why research would be great to support that. Um, however, if you look at the cost of a bottle of curcumin extract, like a pill form of it, um, there are some very expensive products on the market and they've modified them a little bit to make them more absorbable and more bioavailable. Uh, bio but some of those might cost, let's say, 50 bucks a bottle uh, and that bottle might last you a month. Uh, and when you compare that to, let's say, you could go to Zares and buy a um, bag of no-name brand turmeric. Um, it might not be organic, uh, it may not be standardized, but it still might have really good anti-inflammatory properties, anti-cancer properties. And when you look at a lot of the research done on turmeric, um, it's been shown that people who consume turmeric in their diet, it helps reduce the risk of heart disease and cancer and may help with Alzheimer's disease as well. So, um, so I don't think turmeric powder is bad. And the question, one of the things that you want to make sure is, if you're recommending a herbal product and all the traditional indications are done on turmeric, I don't think you can apply those same recommendations necessarily to curcumin extract. So maybe turmeric is used as a carminative uh, to help promote digestion, but the plant also has other constituents that might be responsible for that, while curcumin may or may not have those medicinal properties. So I suspect that you're going to have more medicinal actions with a whole herbal extract than you would from a standardized extract, possibly. Uh, next question. Are the additional descriptions you give about singular herbs within these slides testable? I, th In general, anything on the slides is testable. Anything that comes out of my mouth is to reinforce what's on the slides. So. Uh, I try to I tried to keep the points on the slides as minimal as possible. Um, uh, so my wants to know a bit more about star anise to make tammy flu. So how do you do that? Um, this is a synthetic chemistry question. So how can you go from uh, the question is, how would you go from shikamic acid, which is an intermediate used by the plant to make amino acids, how do you take that compound and turn it into Tamiflu? Uh, we'd have to pull up the structure of the shikamic acid and then compare that to the structure of, the, of Tamiflu, but it's done in a lab uh, and there's at least you know five or ten steps. You couldn't do it at home. There's no way you could do that unless you have a little lab at home and you're making other things. Uh, so I can't really explain the details because it's sort of beyond this class, but it's it's 
done by synthetic chemists in a lab, and you had to have a lot of um, ingredients and equipment in order to do, to do that. Uh, now, uh, as I mentioned before, herbal medical, uh, herbal medicine and research. What I find really interesting is when I was a student at the college in 2003, there was some research coming out at that point in time, but there wasn't tons, and it's still herbal medicine didn't have a lot of um, a lot of clinical trials on it, and uh, I don't think it was even that well accepted by the general public at that point in time. And certainly if you go back to like the 60s, there was no research. So if you look at this little bar graph on the left-hand side, um, this was made from just typing in herbal medicine, I believe, in PubMed. And this is what it gave me for a graph because there's a way to do this display how many studies have been published on herbal medicine. And that doesn't even include the studies done on, let's say, curcumin, which wouldn't necessarily uh, fall into this graph. So this is at the very least is under uh, representing the amount of research being done on herbal medicine and phytochemicals. And so basically 50 years ago, there was essentially no research on this. And now look how much research there is. Um, and I would say it's growing exponentially uh, because there's a lot more interest and there's a lot more people and there's more money going into it. So, um, so I think this is really exciting times. That it's definitely an exponential growth here in the last 20 years. It might level off or it might just keep growing at that rate. So now one of the problems with it, as I mentioned already, is that there isn't a lot of financial incentive necessarily to go into this. So a lot of the research is being done either universities or by drug companies who are hoping to exploit the phytochemicals and modify them to make a patent, a, drug, a patentable drug from it. Um, and also some of the natural supplement companies are trying to make their own uh, proprietary blend or pr pr proprietary extract and marketing that and doing some research on it. Um, now when it comes to herbal medicine, I would say that there are some herbs that have a lot of research to support it. So a herb like St. John's wort, for example, there are numerous clinical trials done with it and to evaluate it for mild, moderate, and severe depression. And generally speaking, I think depending on the systematic review that you read, I would say that the research supports its use for at least mild and moderate depression. And what the research shows that it works as well as conventional antidepressants, and there appears to be less side effects associated with it compared to most of the standard antidepressants. So from an evidence-based model, this should be adopted as the first line therapy for mild to moderate depression. Um, I would say some of the reasons why it's not being used by conventional doctors is one, um, they don't know what brand to recommend because you could buy uh, St. John's wort from company A and it may not have the active ingredients in it or may not have enough of it. Um, they also, uh, yeah, there just isn't a lot of standardization. That's the one reason. Two, I would say that culturally medical doctors don't recommend herbs. And so I don't think, even if there is enough research, I just don't feel that it's in there. They don't feel comfortable recommending it, mainly because it's not in their guidelines. You know, when you look at someone comes in for depression, if you're a medical doctor, you usually give an SSRI, which is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or maybe a norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor, or possibly a tricyclic antidepressant. But you don't jump towards like herbs aren't even on the list usually. There's a few. They're incorporating a few of them now, but so. Um, so I would say St. John's wort for mild and moderate, there's really good evidence. Just as good evidence as conventional, uh, conventional antidepressants. For severe depression, it might also work. I've read a couple clinical trials that say it does work. Other ones say it doesn't, you know, wouldn't be indicated, but um, St. John's wort has, is probably the most researched herb or one of the mo most researched herbs. Um, and in Germany, I've heard uh, that it is one of the drugs that is recommended by medical doctors over there for depression. Now, so that's an example of a herb that's got great research. Now, when I look at other herbs like gentian, gentian has been used in herbal medicine for, I'm sure, thousands of years. <clears throat> you can walk into the LCBO and buy bitter extracts that contain gentian. So it's been used culturally. It's a digestive stimulant for hundreds and hundreds of years as well. You go into bars or, or you buy a bottle of bitters, Chances are it does have gentian in it, and it's been used. 
and people uh, continue to use it, but there's essentially no research. Uh, I haven't been able to find any research on it the last, last time I checked. There was no clinical trials on it. There might be a couple of little in vivo or in vitro trials done with some constituent, but there's essentially no research. Now, the funny thing is, is from an evidence-based model, uh, some people would say, oh, I don't use gentian because there's no research, but gentian is one of my favorite herbs that I use it all the time in practice to help promote digestion. And even though there's little research, because it has such a strong traditional indication, I would I feel very confident in using it. And I would say that there's no drug that works as good or even remotely like gentian. So even though I love research, even though I try to operate in an evidence-based model, for me, an evidence-based model doesn't mean that you ignore tradi traditional indication, especially if it's safe. And so gentian, I, in my opinion, is probably one of the safest, most effective things for treating heartburn and indigestion. Uh, and the drugs in the market are terrible for that, even though they have evidence to show that they do work and do uh, reduce symptoms. Um, gentian is superior. Um, so in my mind, I'm just sort of encouraging you guys Look at the research. I think research is great when it comes out, especially if research shows that a plant or a plant extract or a vitamin isn't safe. I think we should try to understand, um, you know, maybe don't give that plant to someone who's pregnant or maybe it's not indicated for long term. Uh, but if something has a strong historical indication, um, I still think there's a lot of value in that. So we're going to stop here and take a little 10 minute break. Okay, so we are back and ready to go and finish the lecture here. I suspect that what we'll do is we'll finish the BOT 100 intro lecture. I will answer the questions and then we will start on the actions of the lecture next week um, just to make it nice and clean so we have a clean start uh, for the recordings. And at the end of, if you have any questions going through this, just fire me off a whole bunch of questions as we go through it. Maybe what I'll do is if I have some time left over, I will go through and give you a couple of exam, sample exam questions for the intro lecture. Now, I did have a couple questions that came in. Um, uh, so I don't mind answering. We've got time, so I don't mind answering a couple of questions unrelated to herbal medicine, but related to related to natural medicine. Uh, someone asked me a question in regards to depression. What is your take on SAMI? Um, so s adenosylmethionine is what SAMI is, and it's basically a methylating agent that is used. Um, it's a cofactor for a number of reactions in the body. <clears throat> um, methylation reactions have an effect on cell replication. Also, it has an effect on various neurotransmitters in the body. The research on SAMe shows it does have some benefit for depression. Now, other methylators in the body, like methylcobalamin, which is the active form of B12, and also the active form of folic acid, they might or they appear to all have potential benefits for depression as well. They seem to be a little bit more cost-effective than SAMe, so I don't know if it's inferior or not. But um, improving methylation can certainly help uh, when it comes. To managing depression. I think you got to look at the biochemistry and see if that's the primary issue because sometimes, for example, women who are uh, like postpartum depression, if you think about it, most pregnant women are going to be depleted in various methylators like folic acid, B12, um, just because they have a little parasite, cute parasite, but a parasite nonetheless, uh, taking all their nutrients um, and that can cause women to become depressed, one component of it. Um, so looking at um, making sure the person has proper nutrition uh, would be one thing. SAMe, I would consider using it for uh, depression, but it, it is expensive. I usually don't start with SAMe, though. I do other things. Uh, you could also get the precursors for making neurotransmitters, like, for example, tryptophan gets converted to 5-HTP, which you can buy as a supplement, and 5-HTP gets converted into serotonin and melatonin in the body uh, to help with sleep and depression. I've used that with some patients and they found benefit for depression. Uh, I've used B12 shots, so giving someone methylcobalamin um, might also be beneficial. Now, taking the oral form of B12 doesn't seem to work as well as injections, and I will honestly say that 
um, looking at their research, they both should uh, replenish B12 levels in the body the same. But I think when you give an injection, you get a better placebo response. So I offer patients both options, but I usually start with a B12 shot and see how they feel, and they usually have better energy, better sleep. Maybe it's placebo, maybe it's something else, but it's another factor that I might use. Uh, I've also used certain herbs that, uh, like rhodiola, uh, which helps the person adapt to stress. That can help. Fish oil also helps. And then if you go beyond that, exercise has been shown to be as effective as antidepressants. Goal setting is important, helping people find meaning, improving social networks, um, re relaxation techniques, improving sleep, helping someone cope with stress in general. Um, also, if someone, let's say, they hate their job or they're in an abusive relationship, that needs to be addressed. Um, counseling is important, whether you do it. I mean, we're not going to be counseling people. Uh, we're not going to be the primary counselor for patients. It's just not what we do. But you might. Um, you're, you're going to be doing a little bit of that in your practice anyways, um, just from day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, also, I think uh, mindfulness-based meditation is really, really effective for depression. And uh, I would also say that cognitive-based therapy is more of a clinical version of Buddhist mindfulness meditation that works well. So lots of different options. I don't think uh, antidepressants uh, would be my first choice, the drugs anyways. I would go more natural things. And if you look at the placebo response for, I don't know the exact numbers, it kind of depends on various things, but you get about a 40% placebo response rate with depression and maybe the drugs give you a 50 or a 60% response. Uh, it's not that different in my opinion. Um, so why not start with something that's safe uh, with less side effects before moving on to a drug? So I hope that, ans that answers your question, Megan. But your question was about Sammy. Yeah, it works. Uh, I don't use it because of the cost uh, very often. I have used it though. Uh, can we look, next question is from Mackenzie. Can we look up patents as an indication of quality of a product? Um, I would say I don't know. I mean, a patent is just your legal piece of paper that says you can, you have exclusive rights to selling it. It doesn't necessarily say that you have a good purified product or a good high quality product because in theory you could have a, um, you could have a really, really poor, low quality product that has a patent um, and you could have exclusive rights to selling a crummy product. Um, so yeah, I would say patents have nothing to do with quality per se. Carly asks, why isn't there more of a push for standardization of herbal medicine so it can be utilized more? Is there a reason it's not regulated by the FDA? Uh, now don't forget the FDA is uh, that's in the U.S. and Canada. We have a different. We have Health Canada. The FDA is what the U.S. does, and the regulations in the U.S. is very different than regulations in Canada. In Canada, herbal manufacturers, if they're selling a product, they have to actually write on the label of the, of the product what are the main indications for that based on research or historical indications, and so. I think that's kind of neat that Health Canada is actually making manufacturers write what, write, um, like label exactly what the product's being used for. While the FDA uh, does not allow, and they do the opposite, uh, they, not only do they not want you to write on what, what the product's for, but they, you are not allowed to make health claims on the product. And so if you make a, let's say St. John's Wort, it may say St. John's Wort on the bottle in the U.S., but it won't say what you use it for. In Canada, we would say used in, his, in herbal medicine for depression. So um, so that's just an aside. Now, when it comes to why isn't there more of a push for standardization, there are pros and cons of standardization. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Uh, one of the pros is, is that when you standardize a product, it might say, let's say there's 3% Hyperforin or uh, hypericin in a St. John's wort product, um, and so that's a good thing because we know exactly how much hypericin's in it. But the unfortunate thing when it comes to St. John's wort is that hypericin's not the main antidepressant component; it happens to be the hyperforin. And so, although they've been standardizing 
products to, to the high pyrrhosin and doing research on it, the hyperforin is the main active ingredient that you want. And it's rarely if ever standardized um, in the product. So they've standardized it to the wrong active ingredient. And so the issue with this is you could, in theory, take a really weak St. John's wort product and if it didn't have, let's say if it only had 1% hypericin, you could then potentially add in just hypericin to it to bring it up to the 3% mark that you want or the 10% or whatever the value is. And the problem with that is that in relative amounts, the hyperforum would still be low and that that's the main active ingredient. Or if you have you know multiple things working synergistically, you could have a, a product that, although it's standardized, it's not as effective as a whole herb extract. So when you look at traditional herbalists, um, they're, a lot of them are resistant to the idea of standardization for a number of reasons. One, it's very expensive to standardize because what that means is you have to add another step into the product to make sure that it has the active ingredients in it and ultimately the consumer will have to pay for that. So if you had, let's say, a cup of chamomile tea might cost you 25 cents. A standardized extract of chamomile standardized to 5% you know, apigenin or 2% or, uh, atrocin or whatever the active ingredient is, um, that product would probably cost 10 times as much or 5 times as much just because herbal tea is cheap. And the chamomile tea is going to probably work just as well as a standardized extract would, or if not better. So um, that's one of the negative reasons for, for standardizing is cost and making sure that you do standardize it to the correct active ingredient. Um, the positive side of standardizing is if you took a whole herbal extract and standardize it to make sure that it has the active ingredient in it, then you're less likely to get an adulterated product that has the wrong plant in it. You're less likely to have someone who's selling, let's say, a ginseng product where ginseng is very expensive and they may only put a tiny bit in there and just you know, claim that it has ginseng but there's very little in it. This has been an issue in the past. Um, also, if you can standardize the active ingredient, it makes it easier to research and to be accepted by researchers because at least you know that you're looking for a standardized product that has a certain amount of something in it. I think sort of a nice balance between the two is to take whole herb extracts, not allow people to add anything to it um, so you couldn't spike it with a particular chemical to get the standardized dose that you want. Um, um, but just sort of say this product has you know, somewhere between 3 and 5 percent hyperforin or whatever the, the active ingredient is that you're looking for. So, um, so I like standardization and there's pros and cons of it. Um, I don't know uh, what we're going to do in the future. Okay. So does, I hope that answers your question, Carly. Uh, uh, Mackenzie asked me, uh, in the history chapter, you had pictures and descriptions of main herbs, but we don't have the pictures in our notes. Will you be asking, for example, what cultures we're discovering and using those herbs? I will not be asking that because it's not in your slides. I'm including those pictures just more to bulk up the story that I'm trying to tell you. Um, I would say that probably every single one of the herbs that you just see an image that kind of flashes by, uh, I think that all those herbs are going to appear at some point in the lecture again. It may not be uh, probably before the midterm. Some of them might not appear until after the midterm, but you're definitely going to see those herbs again. Uh, so, but you don't need to know it for the exam uh, if it doesn't appear somewhere else. Okay. Um, I wouldn't be asking withania comes from Ayurvedic medicine or ginseng comes from traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, so I guess Mackenzie is, um, Mackenzie, I guess you are in the classroom and typing in questions for other people. Just in case you're wondering why Mackenzie is asking so many questions, I'm assuming that's the case. Uh, so, Ju Young would like to know if we need to know the Latin words. So for the exam, what I'm going to do is give you five questions 
that will say match up the common name with the Latin name. So it'll be five questions for that. And the reason why is that um, you need to know the Latin names later on uh, because the big challenge is that you could have a herb like um, cohosh, black cohosh, and if you don't know the Latin name, there could be four different types of cohoshes out there um, with different Latin names for it. So you could also have another thing like uh, what's another? So for example, there's a tree like it's not. I can't think of a herbal example right now, but there's a tree that grows around here called ironwood, and um, it's a very hard wood that we have uh, in North America or in Canada. But there are ironwoods that grow in the Amazon and Australia uh, that are completely different plants altogether. Uh, but they have the same common name. So the Latin name helps allow you to distinguish between them. Um, but for exam purposes, what I'll do is <clears throat> I will use the common name in most cases. Um, so I might say tumor contains which of the following. But then I'll have somewhere else in the exam where I'll say what is the Latin name for tumor? And it'd be, is it curcuma longa? Is it uh, hydrasis canadensis, etc., etc. So um, and the Latin names will be, if they show up in the slides, uh, those will be the ones that you need to know. Okie doke. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. Let me see if I can finish the next little bit before 11.30. We may finish a little early. We'll see. Any more questions, I'll check back in, in a second. Okay, so pharmacology, um, although, although this is a herbal medicine course, I just want to explain the basics of pharmacology because it helps to, um, by understanding how the pharmacology works, it gives you a better appreciation of how to recommend herbs. Herbal medicine, it may have some magical properties associated with it, but it's based on pharmacology and it's based on a very physical interaction of chemicals with various receptors and proteins in the body. <clears throat> now, when it comes to pharmacology, there's a few different labels or names that were uh, terms that we want to sort of explain to you. <clears throat> pharmacology, it basically means the study of interactions of biologically active ingredients with living systems. So that basically means some chemical interacting with some animal or some kind of things that's created by an animal or an insect or a plant or whatever it may be. Now pharmacognosy is one branch of pharmacology that's related to the medicinal properties that are obtained from natural sources and this could be a herb but it might, might also be something from an animal or from an insect or from a bacteria. And so pharmacognosy sort of looks at uh, naturally occurring substances and what are the effects they might have in medicine. Now two terms that sometimes people get confused between pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. So pharmacodynamics, <clears throat> what that refers to is you have an active ingredient, some kind of drug let's say, and I'll use the term drug but I could be referring to a natural compound or, or a pharmaceutical drug. And what the pharmacodynamic studies do is they evaluate or they look at how these substances interact with the body and so and in particular how it has its effect on the body so you have a drug for example uh, 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 salicylic acid or uh, acetyl salicylic acid so aspirin it binds to an enzyme in the body called cyclooxygenase and inhibits that enzyme to decrease inflammation in the body. And so the study, the pharmaco pharmacodynamic study for that would be basically looking at how the um, acetylsalicylic acid interacts with the enzyme and what enzyme it interacts with to have its effect. So it can interact with some kind of receptor in the body. It could uh, interact with some kind of protein that's involved with transporting things in and out of the cells. Uh, and also it could interact with various enzymes in the body to stimulate or inhibit some sort of biochemical process. Now pharmacokinetics differ than the dynamics 
is because kinetics means like movement or energy. Um, so pharmacokinetics refers to more what the body does to the drug, while pharmacodynamics refers to what the drug does to the body. Okay, and so the drug interacts with a receptor. That's pharmacodynamics. The liver metabolizes the drug through this particular enzyme. That's the pharmacokinetic. So a lot of the studies done with pharmacokinetics refers to, let's say, how the drug is absorbed, where it accumulates in the body, what happens in the liver, whether it's fat soluble, whether it gets stored in other places, and then how the body eliminates it, whether it's excreted in the urine or whether it's um, uh, excreted in the feces. So those are sort of the different things, the difference between the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics. So when a body enters the body, it, when a drug enters the body, it has an effect on various enzymes, transporters, um, hormones, whatever it may be. Well, after the drug is absorbed, the body has to do something with it. And your body is always trying to get rid of stuff. That's its goal. It doesn't want things to accumulate, especially if it's something like a, especially if it's not a nutrient of some sort. It's potentially going to become toxic if it hangs around too long. So your body's constantly trying to get rid of it using the liver and using um, trying to make things more water soluble, more fat soluble, whatever it may be. Uh, finally, another term you probably can figure out what this is, toxicology. It just basically refers to how some kind of chemical or substance negatively affects uh, living organisms. And so they'll take a drug <clears throat> and they'll do toxicology toxicological studies on it by one example would be to determine the LD50 which is the lethal, lethal dose uh, for a particular drug and they'll take a certain amount of the drug and give it to a population of rats and figure out how much of the drug you need to give them before half the population dies and this is something they do all the time in, in um, pharma, uh, pharmaceutical research and it gives you a rough idea of how toxic it is so if it only takes uh, one microgram to kill 50% of the population of rats, you know, it's a pretty toxic substance. If it takes 50 grams to do it, it's a pretty safe substance. Um, so all this has some ethical concerns, but uh, that's what the terms mean, okay? <clears throat> now, when it comes to how these drugs work, picture this, you've got a drug, and I'm referring to the herbal constituents as drugs right now. You have a, a drug, that enters the body and it will bind to a particular receptor in the body. And receptors in the body are a little bit like a good analogy is if you look at a door, you've got a door that's closed and you've got a keyhole. And a drug might go to that keyhole and go into it and do something. And it has a couple of options that it can do. It can one, unlock the door so then you can open the door. And so that would be let's say an agonist. So the key fits perfectly inside the lock and it allows you to unlock that door and then things can move in and out through the door. So that would be an example of, um, of an agonist, something that binds to a receptor and activates it. And in this case, activating the receptor means you're opening up the, bone, the, the door. Now, another reaction could be is you could have an antagonist. An antagonist, what it does is it's a key as well. So in this case, the key is a drug and it fits into the keyhole, which is the uh, receptor and turns it on and off, uh, or turns it on. Now the antagonist, what it does is it, it's another key and this key fits into the keyhole, but it doesn't have the right physical three-dimensional uh, configuration to unlock the door. And so what it does is it just sort of sticks in the, sticks in the receptor or in the keyhole and gets stuck. And what that means is, if I have a key that will unlock the door, but someone's gone and stuck a key in there that won't unlock it, and that key gets stuck in there for a little bit, I can't open the door then. So what it does is it blocks it, or it acts as an antagonist. It, it prevents that process from working. And so an agonist will turn on some receptor or some enzyme, and an antagonist will turn it off. And the reason why it turns it off is because it prevents other agonists from binding to it. And this could be reversible in the sense that you might have a key that you stick into the keyhole, you wiggle it around a few times, 
you're trying to open it up, it doesn't work, and then eventually you're able to take it out. Or it could be, so that would be like a reversible, so it goes in, fiddles with it for a little while, and then it just sort of disappears and goes off, and then it may come back later on and try again. That would be reversible. Irreversible would be something where it goes into the receptor, and instead of, when you turn the key, it doesn't open the door, but rather it just breaks the key in the actual keyhole. And then, no matter what, nobody can open that door anymore. And that would be an example of an irre irreversible antagonist. Okay? So here's an example where it's pretty black and white. Either you turn it on or you turn it off. Now, examples of this, of an agonist, would be, for example, if you had an estrogen receptor, estrogen will bind to the receptor and turn it on. That would be the hormone that's sort of the, the design to work on that. This phenol, which is found in plastics, is also an agonist for uh, estrogen receptors. And so it really binds well to those keyholes and opens that door wide open. And that's what this phenol does. So it increases the risk of getting, let's say, breast cancer and other types of uh, estrogen-based cancers. The antagonist for the same receptor would be, would be something like tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is a drug uh, we haven't spoken about yet. It blocks estrogen receptors and it inhibits estrogen from binding to it. So in this diagram you've got the green or the purple at the top would be like estrogen or bisphenol. You get the black line at the bottom would be an antagonist, meaning there's absolutely no activity when it interacts with those estrogen receptors. It blocks it entirely. Now the world isn't black and white and when it comes to herbal medicine there's a lot of gray area in herbal medicine. Now most a lot of herbs, I don't want to say most, but an awful lot of herbs that we use, I would say the majority of them, are not necessarily full-blown agonists or full-blown antagonists. They're a modulator. And so their effect is somewhere in between that. So a modulator, another term for a modulator is a partial agonist. And so this would be something that the key fits in the keyhole, but it's not a perfect fit. And so what that means is if I go to open the door up and I stick my key, it's like whoever cut the key didn't do a very good job. So you're sitting there and you're fiddling around. It might take you 30 seconds to sort of fiddling with the key in order to open the door up. And while I'm there fiddling with the keyhole trying to get the door to open up, nobody else can put their key in to turn it on or to turn it off. And so I'm sort of occupying the space, but I'm only opening the door, let's say, takes me about 30 seconds or a minute to open the door. Compared to if you have a perfectly cut key, it's only going to take you like one second to open the door. And so what that means is the door doesn't remain open as long so that the response that it has in the body is not the same as a full-blown agonist. So in the case of uh, the modulators or par partial agonists, an example of this would be a phytoestrogen, which modulates estrogen receptors. It doesn't fully turn it on, it doesn't fully turn it off. And what this means is um, phytoestrogens is that under certain circumstances, if you take, let's say, soy and you are, or flax seeds, and you are a woman who is 25 years old and you've got really bad hormonal cramps and, and your hormones are really out of whack and they're kind of fluctuating a lot what taking something like a phytoestrogen can do is it can balance the hormones and because the phytoestrogens act as a partial agonist what ends up happening is they block your body's endogenous estrogen from binding to those receptors and having some sort of activity and so as a result the overall response rate when you combine estrogen with a phytoestrogen is instead of being let's say a hundred percent it may drop it somewhere between a hundred and fifty percent with the you know, let's say the modulators there. So maybe the overall effect is only at 75%. So it balances the hormones. If it's a little high, it brings it down. Now let's say if a woman uh, was perimenopausal and she had no estrogen floating or very, very little estrogen floating in her body and she took and she was experiencing hot flashes and vaginal dryness and mood disturbances that are all a result of really low estrogen levels. If they took a phytoestrogen, they may see um, the overall effect uh, response rate increase when they take that. 
So in that case, it might help to treat hot flashes, or it might be used to improve mood associated with um, menopause. So partial agonists, they don't fully turn on the receptor, they don't fully turn it off, they modulate. So in situations where there's too much estrogen, it'll bring it down and normalize it a bit. And if there's too little estrogen, it helps to bring it up a little bit. Okay, so that's what the, uh, the modulators do. The other thing that we have to be careful of is that, is that if someone was taking, let's say, an antagonist drug like tamoxifen because the patient had breast cancer and we're trying to block the estrogen in the body, if you were to take a phytoestrogen, it might, in theory, interact with tamoxifen and make it less effective. And in that case, um, that could be, be dangerous. So in most cases, uh, phytoestrogens are pretty safe. I just would be very careful about giving to someone who is taking uh, something like tamoxifen, some kind of antagonist for that receptor, because it may um, make them make that drug less effective. Now I'm going to show you a couple little pictures here. So here is an estrogen receptor in the body, and so it's like a little cave that the estrogen floats into. And the way it works is the OH groups on that estrogen molecule interact with uh, OH groups tend to be a little bit more negatively charged, and there's positively charged amino acid, um, sort of their little, uh, um, what do you call them, um, the little side chains on them uh, are going to be a little bit more positive. So they interact with estrogen. So estrogen estrogen's in there. Once it kind of wiggles its way into that receptor, it turns it on, and you get the s symptoms or the, the, the effects associated with the estrogen in the body. Now, Watch what happens when it changes. So this is estrogen. This is a phytoestrogen. If you look three-dimensionally, it fits pretty good inside that receptor, but it's not quite the same fit as you'll get with the estrogen. So it kind of wiggles around, so it doesn't, it sort of has to bounce around a little bit in order for it to have the same activation. And so even though structurally it doesn't look anything like estrogen, um, in three-dimensional space, D2 OH groups are the main active groups, and they seem to be able to get into this uh, active site and have the, uh, the effects that you want, but not as well as estrogen does, okay? So there's the estrogen. That's a steroid molecule. Here's the phytoestrogen. This is a type of isoflavonoid. Now, if I move on to the next compound, this is something called bisphenol. Now, bisphenol is even better at stimulating estrogen receptors than estrogen itself is. So this bisphenol compound, uh, it has a very, very strong um, agonist effect on estrogen. And so even small amounts of the body can stimulate breast cancer cells to grow. And so that's why we don't want bisphenols in, in, uh, in, a, in, the, uh, in our water bottles or in the plastics that we cook our foods in uh, or the toys that our children eat. And that's just a slide for you guys so you can see the difference between the estrogen receptor with um, the estrogen and a modulator or a partial agonist on the left and a strong agonist on the right. Another way that you can look at this is here we've got an image of, uh, let me just start here. Oh, sorry. I don't know how this is work. Something happened with the formatting on this, but so the green uh, little balls on the left, they represent some sort of drug or hormone in the body. Either it's endogenously made, meaning it's made by the body, or it's taken, uh, exog it's an exogenous compound, meaning it comes in from, uh, from the environment somewhere, wh whether it's deliberate or not. And so right now, this enzyme isn't doing anything in the body. <clears throat> And so the estrogen has little positive and negative charges on it that will help this protein to rearrange the structure to release the active site. So, so here we've got the green drug binds to the receptor up top. The positive and the negative uh, charges all line up. And as a result, the active group sort of falls down, becomes available through that binding site there, the active site. And now whatever that pink substance is, it could be like cyclic AMP for, or ATP getting converted to cyclic AMP or something. It's now able to do its job. So 
you need the drug to bind. And once it binds, the active site is exposed, and then it's able to do its job. Now, here's a drug where, in this case, you've got an antagonist in that red little block box there. It has the negative charges, but it doesn't have the required positive charges to interact with that receptor to unlock it. So it just occupies the active site and prevents other drugs or other things from binding to it. So it basically leaves it in the off position. And I did have a modulator. I don't know where it went to. Hold on. Let me just scroll back. Okay. This may be out of order. I don't know. Now, this yellow thing here, this is like a partial agonist where it, this is sort of a illustration of how it might work, where it binds to the active site, but it doesn't fully unlock that active, it binds to the, um, uh, to the receptor site, but it doesn't allow for the active site to be fully exposed. And so as a result, um, the drug is still, or the, the, the effects of it are still being felt by the body, but not to the same degree. So it's basically blocking the other agonists or antagonists from interacting with the receptor, but it's not fully activating the active site required to have the chemical effects. Anyways, you don't need, need to know too much about that. Just remember the antagonist turns off the enzyme. Uh, you've got a reversible one where it binds for a little while and then goes off, and irreversible means it goes in there, denatures the active site, and then it no longer works until the body makes a new enzyme. Now, one other thing that kind of complicated is that in the body, there are different types of receptors. And so it might be that, for example, soy has a greater affinity for estrogen receptors in, let's say, uh, the central nervous system and in bone. And so there's some, it looks like there's some research that suggests that soy has a beneficial effect on hot flashes and may increase bone density but it has a, a lesser affinity for the estrogen receptors in breast and ovarian tissue. So it may act more of a sort of a, a blocker, uh, more of an antagonistic effect in breast and uterine tissues and more of an agonist effect in the central nervous system and the bone. So it might help with hot flashes and osteoporosis and still decrease the risk for breast cancer or ovarian cancer. So um, that's just, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of complicated with these partial agonists. Now I'm going to take a quick little break here and see if I got some questions. Um, so Carly's asking, in the course outline, it says MH for each lecture. Does this mean medical herbalism is the primary resource for these lectures. Um, medical herbalism is a textbook you can read if you want to to get a little bit more information. Um, I guess it's the primary one. We don't I haven't there's no required readings for this. So if you want to read that great. If you get if you can figure it all out from my slides, then we're good. But if you need a backup resource, that would be the one. I think it's a good book and it's worth looking at if you've got time. Uh, uh, what are some examples of irreversible antagonists? They should, they sound pretty scary. What about irreversible agonists? Do they exist? Examples. Um, aspirin, uh, so uh, acetylsalicylic acid, what it does when it interacts with the cyclooxygenase enzyme is it basically transfers that acetyl group onto, I believe that's what it does anyways, um, onto the active site and sort of blocking it and keeping it stuck in a turned off position. Um, so it's not that scary because your body's constantly creating um, new enzymes on a daily basis. So the other thing is that you're going to have a lot of these uh, enzymes available in the body. So if you took aspirin, it's not like, unless you took a really, really high dose, you're not inhibiting every single receptor in the body. You may only be inhibiting um, a percentage of them to decrease inflammation. So um, 
so the drugs might have an, a, an immediate effect that animals may have a little longer effect that lasts for days afterwards. Um, are there examples of irreversible agonists? Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head. I certainly know that bisphenol uh, in plastics, it has it has a really high affinity for estrogen receptors. So it, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's irreversible, but I do know that it binds there and has a very, very potent effect uh, because it fits in there so well it doesn't really like to leave. Uh, now just as an aside when it comes to the uh, bisphenols and plastics and stuff like that, eating more phytoestrogens in your diet, whether that be flax seeds or soy or other sources, uh, has a protective effect against some of those bisphenols just because you're modulating those receptors with um, the phytoestrogen. So, so there you go. Um, <clears throat> now, in herbal medicine, uh, one of the things that we find is that there's people who like talking about energetic medicine. And energetic medicine, I don't really know how to define this. Um, I think on the one extreme, you might have something like uh, Reiki. Uh, I took a Reiki course before coming to the program because I was just curious about everything. And um, Reiki is the belief that you can channel energy from the universe and place your hands above someone to align their chakras or to balance the energy in the body. Um, and so without touch or without any sort of physical interaction or chemical interaction, you can exert a therapeutic effect. Um, so that might be the extreme case. I don't think there's any double bind clinical trying, trials showing that there's benefit of this, but I do think on some level, some people respond well to this and feel better uh, and are happier and maybe it helps to remove some blockages and helps to change their intention. So I'm not going to be too hard on it. Um, I don't think there's any good research. I think the benefits are probably related to placebo, but placebo, depending on, I don't think that's a, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I just mean it in a, you're activating the innate ability of the body to heal itself through intention. And I think that's maybe where something like Reiki would, would work well. Um, whether you had, uh, if you ch changed the practitioner and had someone who was totally, um, untrained in Reiki and compared the uh, outcomes with someone who was like a Reiki master, would you see a difference? If it was double blind, I don't I don't know. Uh, I, I doubt it, but I don't know. Um, so that would be the extreme of the energetic medicine where um, there's no chemical or physical interaction to it. Um, I'm not, don't really see any harm in doing that unless of course somebody comes in and decides that they don't want to get surgery and chemotherapy done, they just want to have Reiki done to cure their cancer. That I think would be very unwise to do. Um, I think as an adjunctive to uh, chemotherapy and to surgery, I see no harm in it and probably it'll make the person feel better and that's great. If you're using it as an alternative, I think that would be stupid, uh, foolish and potentially life-threatening. So that's the extreme with, uh, that's something with Reiki. Now, I would say most homeopathy probably falls under the realm of energetic medicine. Um, when you look at a lot of the homeopathic remedies, they don't have any of the active ingredients in it when you test it because they've been diluted so um, to to um, to already small small dilution or concentrations. So there's a certain point where I think it's after I think it's 30 C doses of homeopathic remedies. Uh, they no longer have any active ingredients in it. And um, lower potencies are more like a herbal, so you might get something like a 6C concentration where it's more like a herb at that point. Uh, it's not really homeopathy, it's more there is a physical effect that it has there. So research done on, on uh, low potency, meaning higher concentrations of the actual chemicals, um, isn't going to be the same sort of research as if you're doing like a 30C or a 200C. And under those circumstances, uh, the belief is that the energy of the substance has been uh, trapped in the water molecules and it communicates to the body that way. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that homeopathy, the reason why homeopaths continue to use homeopathic medicine on patients is because they see benefits a certain percentage of the time. And um, 
if they don't see benefits, then they spend some more time with the patient and they change the remedy up. And, uh, you know, in reality, either they find the right remedy or the person just gets better on their own or you roll the placebo dice again and, and try your luck and see if you get any benefits. So, um, so when it comes to homeopathy, um, it's going to be operating on the high potencies on a much more of an energetic level. Um, and the majority of the research done on that type of homeopathy, uh, I would say, is pretty conclusive that it's no more better than placebo. And I think there are some exceptions to this. I think there's a lot of research that shows benefit of homeopathy, but the amount of research that shows there's no superior than placebo, it outweighs it an awful lot. And I'm not going to get into an academic debate on it right now, but that would be considered, I think homeopaths would agree that it is a form of energetic medicine. And I'd say that there's no harm in doing it as long as you're not uh, giving some form of energetic medicine instead of giving um, uh, an effective treatment. So go with effective treatments and you can use the energetic uh, adjunctively. Now when it comes to herbal medicine, um, a couple of little things to, to talk about here is when you're providing, I think there's an energetic component to herbal medicine for sure. When you take a chemical, let's say if you take ephedra, the herb or ephedrine, the drug, and you give it to someone, you will see a major change in your energy when you take that. So there is an energetic effect that the chemical or the drug has on the body because it's binding to adrenergic receptors and stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. There's an increase in heart rate. There's an elevation of blood pressure. Um, maybe concentration becomes more focused. Maybe there's some heart palpitations, anxiety. There absolutely is an energetic associ effect associated with herbs and drugs, but that energetic effect, in my opinion, uh, cannot be separated from the phytochemicals or from the chemicals in the substance. And when you look at something like Chinese medicine, often people refer to Chinese medicine as being energetic medicine. And I think there's a little bit of confusion between talking about something being energetic medicine versus the way they describe their operating system. So when you're talking about Chinese medicine in the form of herbal medicine, if you were to receive a Chinese patent, you're probably going to be getting, being, you're going, someone's going to give you um, the raw herbs, it might be 10 to 30 grams of raw herbs to boil in a big pot of water and to consume on a daily basis. And when I look at that, you get a lot, this is complex pharmacology. This is, it may have an energetic effect on the body. It may help to clear heat or move stagnation or help to build chi uh, or essence or whatever it may be. And so the language, the operating system has a very energetic sound to it because they're talking about chi and heat and cold and everything else, but it's having a pharmacological effect. And I don't think most Chinese practitioners, uh, herbalists, would, if you told them that you don't want to give the plants, you just want to give the energy of the plant, I think a lot of them would say, no, that's not going to work. You have to give the plant at a certain dosage. And when you look at Chinese Materia Medicas, the books that have described the herbs, they'll say you need to take very precise amounts, two to four grams per day of this herb. Uh, or the formulas might have four grams of this and eight grams of that. So the point is, is that Chinese medicine, yes, there is an um, energetic component to it, but herbal medicine the plants store the energy and release it in the form of chemicals that interact with your body and have a therapeutic effect. Uh, and I would say, again, going back to the language used to describe Ayurvedic medicine or to describe Chinese medicine has a sort of mystical, energetic language associated with it, but you can use this, and I think I mentioned last class, you can use the same language and apply it to pharmaceutical drugs. So an antibiotic can be used to clear heat in the body, or uh, a diuretic can be used to clear uh, a dampness, and so we, we don't want to confuse that. And when it comes to things like acupuncture, uh, which is part of Chinese medicine, there's no doubt that there's an energetic effect on the body when you stick a needle in someone, but we also know there's, when you stick a needle, you're help, helping to stimulate certain nerves, uh, you're um, helping to relax muscles. Um, 
you're uh, telling the body to release more natural endorphins. So there are biochemical effects that happen when you stick a needle in. And just concentrating on the acupuncture points probably won't do the same effect as putting a needle in it. Um, so when it comes to herbal medicine, uh, oh, I'm going to go down to bog flower remedies. Just a, another form of medicine that's related to plants uh, is our bog flower remedies. And the guy on the left there, the picture of him, that's Bach. He was a physician. He had suffered from, from a lot of depression and mental health issues. And he believed that in order to help people, you had to work on a deeper level. And what he would do is take these extracts of plants and dilute them with water and brandy. And they're very, very... Um, dilute extracts of these things, but there are some plant extracts, uh, some constituents in there. And you consider it to be energetic medicine, and you might give, let's say, a particular plant to help build courage or help with anger or whatever it is. Um, and you may have seen, for example, Bach, the rescue remedy. You can find it at most health food stores, and so people, if they have a little bit of anxiety before an exam or a presentation, they might take some Bach flower remedies and for that and it would help, a rescue remedy might help. Now, I can say that um, I know people, including my wife, who I have a lot of respect for, she will use Bach flower remedies in patients sometimes with mental emotional stuff, and patients see benefit from it. And when you look at the research, there are studies that show giving a Bach flower remedy will decrease pain or help with anxiety or depression. But the same studies also show that it's no more effective than giving someone a placebo. And so in my mind, there's nothing wrong with using these things as long as you're not using bulk flower remedies to treat um, cancer or severe anxiety and depression where maybe they need to be uh, received more effective treatments. And so when it comes to research, bulk flower remedies are no more effective than placebo. Homeopathy, there's some studies that show benefit. There's an awful lot that don't. The other issue that I have with homeopathy is that sometimes the studies that show benefit, um, they've actually, the dosage, they're using more of a herbal um, uh, product um, that's a low potency homeopathic, so it's more like a herb, and then it's showing benefit, and then, or maybe the labeling of the product, it may, for example, some of the topical homeopathic remedies for aches and pains, uh, they might contain various homeopathic preparations but then they might have an arnica one mother tincture in there and then still label as a homeopathic even though it's more likely to be uh, a herb. So um, so homeopathy kind of can span both herbal to the energetic realm uh, and that kind of is a bit misleading for people. So uh, when it comes to herbal medicine, the reason why I'm emphasizing this is you know, look at the stuff, figure out what you want to do, but most important, if a book says to give a particular dose of a herb and that's effective, and this is written in, let's say this is probably the dosage that the eclectics were using for, or maybe it dates back to Greco-Roman times, stuff like that, I probably would recommend you follow the, and use the right dosage for the plants and for the herbs. Um, there's a few authors out there that say you don't need to use that dose, you can just use drop dose, like only using three or four drops of a particular herb to have an effect. That does work only with a few herbs, um, including gentian, one of the digestive aids I talked about earlier. I find because it's so bitter and so potent, if you take three or four drops, it still can help stimulate digestion. Um, but most plants, you need to do it within a very precise recommended dose. Um, and if you don't do it in there, you still might get benefits because people do sometimes get um, uh, you know, the placebo response or they'll get better on their own. That's the other thing. Don't forget whether you give them something or you don't give something, some people, most people will eventually get better on their own with the exception of like terminal cancer and stuff like that. So um, so it's best to always give people the right amount of the plant. Um, finally, one other thing on the topic of, doctor, of uh, energetic medicine or more uh, not well established things is it's the doctor and signature. And the doctor, Doctrine of Signature is still referenced in a lot of books, and I'd say a lot of herbalists and even some naturopaths uh, have a strong belief in the Doctrine of Signature, and this is the belief that God communicates to us through little signals 
in nature and that um, plants have little clues on what you can use them for medicinally. So um, depending on how the plant looks, for example, like here's the leaf of Chelidonium. And Chelidonium, if you see when you break it open, it creates this little yellow or orange latex that comes out. And because when people get liver disease, their skin turns yellow, people believe that, for example, Chelidonium is good for jaundice. And liver or um, um, Chelidonium is a great herb for liver conditions and digestion and antispasmodic gallstones and things like that. So it is used for jaundice. Um, but I don't think it's the yellow sap isn't the reason why we use it. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, now there was an article written in Herbalgram, and Herbalgram was published by the American Botanical Council. I really like this magazine. I get a subscription to it every year. I like supporting their organization. The American Botanical Council is doing some amazing, amazing work. Uh, I also took a photography course with the Steve Foster, who's the guy who did the uh, the cover of who does the cover of most actually does most of the photographs in here. Not all of them, but most of them. And they had an article on the Doctrine of Signatures, and what they concluded by looking at the research on it is that pretty much all modern scholars are nearly universal in discounting the Doctrine of Signatures, calling it absurd, fanciful, far-fetched, and pseudoscientific. Nonetheless, researchers continue to refer to the Doctrine as the reason that many plants are selected for medical use. Careful evaluation of the Doctrine of Signatures shows that it did not function as a priori clue to therapeutic value. Instead, it served as a mnemonic, which was especially important in preliterate cultures. So, what that basically means is, I think a lot of scientists and herbalists now accept that the doctrine of signature, it's a useful mnemonic. So, if it helps you remember that when you pick chelidonium, it excretes a yellow latex, and you go, yellow is good for the liver, that's what chelidonium is good for, then that's great. But what, basically, the conclusion from this article is, is that the fact that something has a yellow flower or a yellow bark uh, or yellow leaves or whatever it is, that alone does not mean it's a way you can predict what you can use it for. You can't deduce the medicinal actions and properties of a plant uh, based on its appearance. And so, for example, like just because a carrot is phallic shaped doesn't mean it's going to be good for erectile dysfunction. You know, uh, just because um, I, there's many, there's some, some of the reasons would be ridiculous. I mean, there are many plants that are yellow, like daffodils, that are toxic, that aren't good for the liver. Um, you know, yes, dandelion has a yellow flower, it's good for the liver, so if that helps you remember it, that's great. Uh, but don't go and try to find new uh, herbal indications based on the appearance. Um, just use it as a way to remember what the plant's going to use for if it sort of under those situations works, okay? All right, so can I get some questions from you guys? We're at 1140, we've got about 10 minutes, we can ask some questions if you want. Here's a question here. Should a patient who has previously gone into remission from breast cancer avoid soy? Is this something we should be cautious of when formulating treatment plants? I would say, um, if someone is in breast cancer remission, uh, should they take soy? This is sort of a bit controversial. I would say that most, a lot of oncologists would probably say you should be avoiding phytoestrogens. I know that for things like flaxseed and soy, if you had active breast cancer and you're taking tamoxifen, I probably would not want to recommend that. Um, I don't want to say with 100% certainty because I don't think we know exactly, but I would say I'd be, I'm pretty comfortable with someone who has a history of breast cancer um, eating soy or taking flaxseed. Flaxseed, we know that it actually helps reduce the risk uh, of breast cancer and can improve outcomes. And it may be that it helps to, the soy and the, and the flaxseeds helps to modulate your body's endogenous estrogens or helps protect you against exogenous estrogens like bisphenol. So um, a little bit of soy in the diet probably is not going to be a bad thing. Taking flax seeds every day I think is going to be a good thing for that. Um, there is certainly some research I'm going to bring up later on about the effects of flaxseed and breast cancer. I'll just sort of mention in passing uh, some systematic reviews. So um, 
I could be wrong, but I, I'm leaning more towards that it probably is going to be more protective if they're in remission than not. And if it was active, I don't know if it's good. And one of the issues with soy, the reason why people say that soy can cause cancer, breast cancer, is because what happens is, if you remember going back to it's a, uh, to the slides about it being a partial agonist, I'm going to, I'm just going to skip there really quickly. So that slide there. Um, one of the issues here is the fact that um, it modulates. And so if you have a test tube that has a breast cancer cell in it, and there's nothing else in it, just water and breast cancer, that's all you got inside the test tube. And if you add in soy to it, it will stimulate the growth of those cancer cells a little bit. And that's because it does bind to these receptors a bit and has a, a slight stimulatory effect. Now, when you compare that to, it may only stimulate them by like a factor of, let's say, one or two or something like that. I'm making up these numbers, but just to put it in perspective. While if you were to take, let's say, estrogen in the levels that would appear in the body and put it in the test tube. So all you have is water, cancer cells, and the concentration of estrogen that would normally be floating around your body, it might stimulate those estrogen cells a hundredfold. And so, although soy does stimulate estrogen cancers, it has a very slight stimulatory effect. And if you were to combine soy and the endogenous estrogen in the test tube with the cancer cells, it would it might stimulate the cancer cells a little bit more than if there was no phytoestrogens and estrogens in the test tube, but it will decrease this, the cancer growth compared to the estrogen alone. So if there's estrogen, it stimulates a lot. If there's soy, soy it stimulates a, a little bit. If there's estrogen and soy, it stimulates it somewhere in between. So in that case, it will have a slightly protective effect. Uh, if there's either the endogenous estrogen or the, um, the, the xenoestrogens from bisphenol and stuff like that, or other environmental estrogens. So, it's kind of confusing. It's not a black and white thing. And I think that for doctors to say that soy, to, to say that um, phytoestrogens are bad and they cause cancer, it's only talking about a part of the story because it, it appears that there's good research to show that it actually has a protective effect. So, um, so to answer the question, I don't really know. But I'm leaning towards it's probably a better idea than not. But it might also be dose dependent. Uh, okay. Um, does anyone else have a question for me? I've got a couple more minutes here. What I could do is I'm just going to read off a couple exam questions. So I'm just looking at my laptop over here. Um, so here's a question that I might ask on the introduction slide. Uh, which of the following drugs occurs in nature, does not occur in nature, or is synthesized from a natural compound, or, uh, you know, so a drug that does not occur in nature would be maybe something like um, uh, Tamiflu. A drug that exists in nature but doesn't, was never used in herbal medicine would be something like Taxol, you know. Uh, a drug that exists in nature uh, and is used historically for that could be a drug, uh, a herb like, or a drug like um, Digoxin, okay. Uh, I got. Uh, I might say a competitive inhibitor could also be referred to as an agonist, antagonist, modulator, partial agonist, whatever it may be. Like I may cap some of these questions. If you have some phytochemical extract, uh, and you want to find out where this compound binds or what receptors it binds to in the body or if you want to look at the toxic effects or you want to look at uh, how the liver metabolizes that drug, like I'm giving you a few different ideas for questions, you would want to design a study that looks at the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacognancy, the pharmacotoxicology, the pharmacodynamics. So if the drug interacts with the receptor, that's pharmacodynamics. If you're looking at how the drug is metabolized by the body, like by the liver, excreted by the kidneys, excreted in the, in the urine, and that's the pharmacokinetics. 
Uh, question true false about herbs, which of the following statements that herbs is safe or is true? Um, A, they're safer than drugs. B, they have more side effects than drugs. I'm making these things up. Uh, C, they have one or two active ingredients. Uh, D, they're very precise. Um, here's a quick question, or here's a question on the history. The book, whatever it may be, was written by which of the following famous physicians? So, some book or some scroll or some scribe or tablet was written by who? Was it Dioscorides, Paracelsius, whoever it may be? Um, which medical system described, uh, let's say, the three, the four humors or the three doshas or the yin yang theory? Is it A, Ayurvedic, D, Greco Roman, C, TCM? Uh, here's another question that's talking about which of the following drugs was obtained by this process or that process. Uh, here's a question. Which of the following question or which of the following uh, is most likely or least likely to cause side effects, depending on the, how I word the question. Would it be a partial agonist, an agonist, an antagonist? Um, I think that's what I, all I have. So those are just a couple examples. If you're wondering about the questions for the uh, for the exam uh, for that for these sections. Now, one more question: Should a patient with propylene gone into? Oh, nope, already answered that. Okay, so I think we're done for today. If you can do me a favor and just type in your question, say, let me know if you like the remote lectures or if there's. Uh, something you didn't like about it or if there's some concern you have just say all good or pretty good or hard to hear or whatever I'm just curious to get a little bit of feedback if you can take one second just to type me a single sentence or a couple words that would be great and otherwise uh, we will do the actions I posted the lecture already and we will cover that entire PDF of the botanical actions before the midterm so we'll do that same time next week, 9.30 in the morning till 12. These lectures will be recorded and posted um, hopefully within a couple of days of finishing them. So if you uh, can't make it to class, they will be pre-recorded. Uh, but there's always going to be the chance that um, there was an error. So we're going to try to try to record them um, for you guys and post that, okay? Anyways, you guys have a great week, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for showing up this morning.